since it's chapter six this week, uh, the package within. Yeah, so this chapter is about walking through the development of another small toy package. Um, it's very similar to chapter two, the whole game. But in chapter two, we focused on the basic mechanics of package development, whereas in this chapter, we emphasize the package's R code and how it differs from um, R code in just an a anal analysis script. So the roadmap for this chapter is we first <clears throat> work with a data analysis script, and then we isolate and extract the the data and the logic from the script. And then we put the code into an R package and we would use a package in a newly simplified script. And so this chapter also makes some mistakes along the way to highlight uh, certain differences for R code that is used inside a package. And as you can see these sections, they are labeled according to the NATO phonetic alphabet. Um, and so section one is alpha, a script that works. So here we're gonna work with a fictional script for a data set of people who went for a scrim, a swim. And so here we have a data set with the name, the where, and the temp temperature columns. And um, in our script, we we analyze this data or we write some code such as classifying these observations according to whether uh, or how they describe the beach and classifying them as American or British. And then we also convert the temperature to Celsius. And, and after we do that, we write the data back to a CSV file and we capture this timestamp inside the file name here. Okay. And the next section is we want to extract out the script into a package. And so we see that there are some suboptimal coding practices that make it hard to catch um, or uh, to detect a package within the script. And so let's refactor this code. Um, and so here is the next version of the script. And so we can see that we are using the tidyverse package here. Um, and let's see what else are we using. So we're using read R and deploy R. And then we put these lookup or uh, we put the, the where and the English columns into a lookup table. And we also create these uh, functions F2C, which is for converting Fahrenheit to uh, Celsius. And the timestamp function, which is uh, to format the time into uh, a certain format. And then the out file path function, which um, this, this is basically just uh, creates the, the path of the file. And, it, and the, the, the name of the path contained the timestamp. So now that we have re reformatted this, this script, um, they say that it's it's uh, it's easier to uh, detect the reusable bits of this script, which are the bits that have nothing to do with an input file like swim.csv. All right, so I'll move on. If there are no questions, cool. Thank you, Uh So next section is external helper helpers. Um, and so uh, we we move the reusable data and then the logic into separate files. So we we move the the lookup table into a CSV called beach lookup table .csv. and then here is another R script called cleaning helpers. And these are uh, these are all. Um, Helper helper functions like localized beach, uh, which contains um, a, a lookup table, which just reads in the the CSV here, 
and then joins the CSV with a data set that the user provides here. Then the function, uh, the FTOC function is also here. Um, and then this selfify temp function, which, which, uh, uses the dplyr verb mutate to create a column called temp. And this column, um, looks at whether the English column is US or not. If it is US, then we convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. And if it's not, then just we leave it as leave the temperature column as, as is. Then there's a now, um, this is just for looking at the, the present, present time in the, in your, uh, according to your system. Uh, and then the timestamp function, which is, uh, what I talked about, then the out file pass function. Yeah. So what this is, is we are just using our helper functions. Um, we, we, uh, load these functions using the source function. And then we um, well, go through reading in the swim.csv file. And then using this that, that object, we, we use our helper function, localized speech and uh, selfified temperature. And we get this final output. And then at the end, we uh, save this data set to a CSV file using the write CSV function. And then we use this out file pass function to uh, name our CSV file. So as you can see, uh, our script is shorter and cleaner, but it really depends on, uh, so whether it's easier depends on personal preference. And so, uh, the book also refers to the tidyverse design guide, uh, for something that you can look at to, to design your, uh, R code. Nobody else has questions. Shall I move on to Delta. So now that we have a script, we we want to scaffold the new R package by uh, using this use this create package function, and then we we move our cleaning helpers R into our new package. Uh, specifically, we move this into the uh, R folder. And then we move our CSV file into, uh, the, the root, root directory. So the top level of the new source package. After we do that, we install our package and then we take it for a spin by using the library Delta, which is our uh, new package. Um, and so this, this library call replaces this source call. And when we run this, um, the script, we see these two error messages that um, is just telling us that um, R could not find the function localized speech and then this out file pass function. So the reason that we see these error messages are that um, library delta we call all these we call library delta, but none of the functions inside delta were actually available to use because. Um, attaching a package does not make the functions inside the package available in the global workspace because, um, right now all our functions are, are internal functions and we need to export these functions by putting this at export Roxygen comments above each function. And so, um, this, this comment here is what we use to export these functions. And what I mean by export is we want to make these functions inside our package available to the users. Yeah. So, um, um in, I'm sure, yeah. but I, I think we need to run dev tool document also. I'm, I'm unsure because I haven't tried. It. Oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is what I wrote, but I think when you have like disrupt season helper, like you need to run document, which I'm still unclear what is doing to do that. But we'll probably learn it later, so it's no big deal. Like if we yeah, I think the on this. book. Yeah, document. Yeah, the book mentions. Oh. 
uh, DevTools document later on. Yeah, okay. So yeah, yeah. maybe later. Yeah. Yeah, so this chapter contains a lot of references to uh, future chapters like uh, section 10.4, which we can use, uh, which you can look at for more information on the description um, description file. And so now that we we put um, export in our functions, uh, it works sort of because now we only see this error message here. Um, Beach lookup table that CSV does not exist in current working directory. And so the problem with this is you can't just put CSV files into your R package and expect it to work. Um, but uh, even though we see this error, you can still install and attach this package. So this just means that uh, broken packages can still be used. But if you want to prevent this sort of error message, you should run R CME check, or even something easier is DevTools check often during development to uh, that, that this will alert you to the problem that you see here. And so, uh, yeah, so this, this, is, this message tells you that there's no package called tidyverse. And the reason behind this is that uh, you can't you can't use this library function in a in a script. And the reason is tidyverse is a dependency, and dependencies on other packages must be declared in the description file, which is what we talk about here in this chapter. Right. So to fix all these problems, uh, we move on to the next section, which is echo, and we'll make a package that actually works. Um, and so we have we have this lookup table, and we export the localized speech function, but we don't export the f to c function. We make this internal so that users can use it. Um, the export from we use export. Hey, Howard, just sorry to interrupt. Um, I yeah, I know that ahead. with some packages, um, I know with like, I use a lot of stand for the stuff I'm doing, and there's lots of internal functions that are actually quite useful that they don't explicitly export, but you can actually access them by doing. Is it the free colons? Does anyone have experience yeah. with this? Where like so technically, even if something if you haven't said export, you technically can still access it when you load a package. So like uh, technically, if you if this would work if you were to like get rid of the export commands and then just go like. What's the package called? Whatever, and then like three colons, and then access it. Okay. I don't know. Maybe. I think I've heard. I know. No, I know. In practice, you wouldn't do that, but I'm just like interested in, in that uh, as a. What, what do you, What do you mean? Like, uh, I will type in the chat to be clear, if I understand correctly. Like, oh, let's yeah. say like deep layer. Uh, and three colon. You mean like I don't know. Like command from deep layers is like uh, select. Like. Something like that. I I, I tap Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So I believe it's three. Um, but um, yeah. Well, there's yeah, some way you have right. to like you have to like you like almost like you would in Python. You have to like, sort of like name it to an object because it's not actually in your namespace. So you do like your three things, call the function, and then like put it to your namespace. And I think that's the way you access it. But I could be wrong. I'm, I just I seem to remember having to do that one time. No, that's uh, definitely that's right. In this case. Oh, is it? Oh, cool. Great. That's definitely right. Yeah. Um, it's really helpful if, you know, you're looking at a function, you type out the name of the function and just hit enter to look at the code. And it's like, oh, it calls these three functions, which are internal. And you're like, yes. what is it doing? That's exactly <laughs> when I want to investigate, you know, those functions. Anyway. Yeah, cool. But you, right. you still have to install the package. Yep. Yeah. I you believe so. Yeah. You do not need to attach it. So I do not I do not know the distinction between deep, this version two semicolon or three semicolon. What the difference has been with these two? I will have to check later. So the the two semicolon means that you've exported the function. That's what Howard's talking about oh. right now. Is uh, and three semicolons. Those are internal functions that the fun the package needs to run, 
um, but it's not really meant for you end users to use. Um, and so it's kind of like hidden and you can secretly access it, I guess, with the three, the three colons, um, but it's not really intended to be used that way. So you really kind of want to proceed with caution when you're doing that. But if you're like trying to figure out if you're an end user and you're trying to figure out what the heck your function, the function that you're trying to use is doing with the internal function, like, I don't know, uh, I, I can't remember the last function I did this with, but if you look at the code for a function, it'll call on other functions within the package, which are internal, which are not exported. Um, and those are the ones you want to do that with. Yeah. Oh, cool. Is um, Are all the uh, utility functions, are they just internal by design so that uh, uh, the exported functions use those utility functions, but the users are not supposed to use them because they are just utility functions? Yes. Are you talking about the utils package or are you talking about just like when you say utility, I, I'm sorry if there's jargon in the chapter that says utility functions like internal functions. Yeah, um, I'm just talking about like utils.r. Uh, usually in like packages you have like utils.r uh, script that just like contains utility functions that the, uh, the author has uh, wrote to use inside other functions. I was just wondering if like those functions would be like a good example of internal functions that users should not use. That's exactly what they are, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then sometimes like those like helper functions is I think I described in the chapter that put within a script for another function. So it's like, it's a, it, it, I think Hadley makes it pretty clear that like it's it's pretty flexible about where, where you want to structure it. Like utils functions, I suppose, are functions that are used throughout the entire package. But then if you have like, a bunch of helper functions that are specific to one function, you might put it in one script. So like sometimes you might find non-exported functions, I suppose, in like other scripts that aren't necessarily utils, if I'm understanding that correctly. But um okay. Mm. I, I have jumped into the question for Jenny, and we can use that as a question and, and looks uh, and add more to stuff. So I will I will just add the question, like feel free to review it on the here. I will copy past the link on the chat. I have the chat very easy here. And I will add the I will add the question like uh, um, something general about utility function like are they exported, are they used? Something like that. So we are is it, <clears throat> if you are okay with it. So we can have sure. like our point of view on that. Uh, what about utilities, utility function? I don't know if it's function. Uh, what about utility function? Um, should they be exposed? Oops. Yeah, it's lagging. I suppose an interesting case as well, like if you've got a bunch of functions that like you you don't export. So like you you protect, perhaps don't like spend a lot of time making them look pretty and like having all the documentation. Right. But given that people can still actually access them if they use the triple, triple colons, it's right. like almost like this thing where it's like, hey, anything you put in your package, like you should spend time on, even if something is like a three line function, you know, that you're not, you're never going to export. So it's like an interesting yeah. case, isn't it? Where like, you know, you... Mm -hmm. Comes I like that. Um... Yeah, I think that captures the question well. So we, I mean, anyway, we can like review it later, so just like to remember that we had this discussion and, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Big cool. note. I thought, I thought like, um, like I thought the internal functions are something like we, we are functions that we never document. So like we don't use any of the R oxygen comments to like um, document the usage, the the example or like the the variable uh, or um, the the output of the function, but with the exported functions, we want to properly document them because when we do question mark and then function, then we'll see the documentation for these functions that are exported. But I'm not sure if if you if you do question mark and function for an internal function, if that will pull up a documentation or a help page. 
Yeah, it's hard to know whether the document function will create, like, you know, we run document with, with DevTools, but it actually creates a, like a HTML document for a non-exported function. I don't know if that's a, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe, um, maybe the book will discuss this, uh, in a later yeah. chapter, like in chapter 16, which is a function documentation. Maybe you'll learn yeah, about that. Yeah. Then. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so uh, moving on, we uh, so we created a data frame lookup table. Yeah, so lookup table and chapter eight data, this chapter here provides more guidance on how to load data sets properly in a package. So uh, and another note is I'm calling functions from other packages like dplyr, we should specify the package that we're using. So dplyr and then two colons mutate. And so um, we might be tempted to use tidyverse instead of dplyr, um, but the book mentions that we should identify the specific package being used rather than the meta package, which is in this case, uh, the tidyverse. Um, and I think the reason I, I saw somewhere that like if you if you mention this meta package tidyverse, then um, it just creates a lot more dependencies on your package because because tidyverse itself has a lot of dependencies, and by by using the tidyverse by meshing the tidyverse, you are bringing in all the tidyverse dependencies into your own package. And that makes your package just really heavy. And so to, to make a lightweight package, you should definitely just refer to dplyr, just a single package instead of a meta package, tidyverse. If I'm, does that sound correct? Yeah, I think it's part of the, the reason, like I can imagine other reason, like, so you have the dependency also like, if the user want to use your package, you will have to install all the tidyverse instead of just the dplyr. So yeah, yeah, it's less it's less difficult for him like to because like every time like you want to I mean depending of your operating system, but installing a tidyverse sometimes can be I mean yeah long, especially if you if you need to build. It. But yeah, I think this is another reason like you have like. Uh, so, like, I, I do not think there is like a, um, conflict between the name inside the tidyverse, but there is definitely conflict uh, into the name of some function. So you specify uh, it's better like to specify package and function, so you avoid like some kind of conflict. I'm thinking of lag, yes. for example, but... or select. The select one was one that got my students for like three years because of the mass package. Yeah. yeah, it's true. In the master. Yeah, it's got to a point, um, Ryan, where like every time I write select, I literally type in dplr dot select, and like it's just how I, that's how select is in my brain now, like because it's it seems like every package you it's like attaching, overriding select, and you're like, oh again, like why can't people just do a slightly different verb? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's interesting you say that. I think um, Hadley wrote a package just. Uh, to resolve these sort of conflicts. I think it's called conflicted. Yeah, I think there's a package that do that. Like to load before loading as a package. <laughs> yeah, yeah, conflict's great. Like you just basically state the package and then the one you over over override it. I think you do that first and then it just like, um, yeah, yeah, it's great. I think this is the package. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Can you share that link in the chat? Sorry. Yeah, sure. A good idea. So apparently if you load filter, I mean, if you use filter, it also gives you a conflict because it's found in two packages. Stats apparently, so it's a base uh, package. At that it's a base right? package, yeah. yeah. And so you can use conflict prefer to declare preference. I assume that this is consistent in that session. So if you close R and restart it, that setting is going away like it's a local setting. 
Yeah, it seems to be. I haven't used it for a while, but. Mm -hmm. Do you have to put that at the start of your script each time? Yeah, you I need suppose. to load it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it's kind of I don't know. It's it seems gadgety, but like maybe at some points, like you really need it, and then you. I mean, most of the time you can avoid it by naming correctly, but uh, maybe at some times you can't, and then uh, it's become very handy. I don't know. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, so as we mentioned, all the user facing functions have this at export tag in their rock, our oxygen comment. So this means that when you run DevTools document, um, the, all these functions are added correctly to the, the namespace file. And we uh, will learn more about this file in chapter 10 here, description okay. and namespace. So Farnai to Celsius is not a user's, uh, what's the name of it? Yeah, F2C. Yeah, OK. Yeah, apparently it's not, it's not user facing. OK. Yeah. Um, I think it's because we only use this function inside uh, this function? mutate call. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like a utility function in a way. Uh, yeah, because I was trying to figure out, but I haven't read something about it. So maybe it will come later. Yeah, I might just come in chapter 10 a bit, a bit early. Um, yeah, so when you install the package now, you'll see so this part was really confusing to me um, because this goes into like uncoded variable names from the dplyr package. And so the the book mentions this vignette, uh, but I haven't looked at this yet. But uh, basically, the wording is no visible binding for global variables English and uh, temp. And so what I what I understand is, in this function we we use this variable temp, and then English here. But since this is unquoted, R just finds this suspicious and sorts us an error or a note, undefined global function of variables. Good. They are not defined in your um, in your source file, like so. You 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 have like this file that that object R objects that are not defined, so it could be an error. You know, like your temp or what's the other name, like English? English, yeah. Uh, it came from uh, the data, I think, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it, it comes from that. Yeah, and, and, and it's not defined, so it cannot find it. I think so this are is you saying... it's, yeah, it's so It's haven't been so... defined earlier. Like, you know, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can use Celsify temp to another... Uh, Another data frame that do not have temp or. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. So, so if your input. Well, well data temp, frame... temp should be okay because temp, you're creating a variable called temp. It's more English that's the problem, right? Because English necessarily doesn't necessarily need to be in data. No, you call it also inside of the GPR if else. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. you it's call it here, right? Mm. But. Yeah. I assume it's because of that, and then like they use this this trick, like define it by null. <laughs> define it null. Yeah. Oh. So it's it's defined in your script because like you, you define it at nothing. I don't know if it's some things that I'm confident to play with, but <laughs> I don't know what is better. Yeah. Well, it, would it well, would it fix the problem if we included? temp and English as arguments to that function. Because that way then then you have to pass them in. It's sort of making it explicit that this is something that is defined within the local environment when the oh, function is yeah. being run. With that, like, because I, I was a bit confused by when Hadley said you have to define them as null, but like surely if you just include them as arguments, then within that function, you know, yeah. some global it, temp, they would be defined. It will work. Hmm. It works. Probably. 
You have to try. Okay. Maybe we can try it and then if we can't figure it out, we can ask uh, Jenny. <laughs> okay, I will, I will, we can just add the question, more question we are better, we are. Uh, so how can I frame that? Uh, uh, oh, the date is not correct, guys. If we, if we, if we write the date in another format, we'll be killed by uh, Jenny Bryan. Oh, yeah. We, uh, we need to use the ISO one, I'm afraid. Uh, how should I frame that? Uh, about temp. And English. Variable in chapter six. Um, yeah. So there's we a add them as argument in the function. Was that right? In the function to avoid it. Yeah. So I was just going to say that there is a the, um, explanation at the end of six point six. In the in the book, not the. Oh. Okay. Yeah. And you can rephrase if my English is terrible. That's okay. And then if we do do not, I mean, it's it's kind of like this is just a warning, no, on the air command check, no. It's a note. It's a note, so not even a warning. So. Uh huh. Well, the book does um, provide you more details. Well. For more details, see the pro programming was deployed in that. So, yeah, so this thing that talks about this note, the same note here, yeah. and define global functions or variables. And then um, you can eliminate this by using dot data where and importing dot data from the source, the Arlang package. So I guess if you just use dot data, then you can eliminate this uh, this note. Okay. Yeah. Which rely on how long something, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, Arlang, yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay. Um. And then the second note that we use, the second warning that we saw is um, all user level objects in a package should have documentations. And so these functions are not documented, even though they are exported functions. And so uh, using our session comments to document it should solve this problem and more to come in chapter 16. Whoa. That's a long run. A long note. Yeah, it will be long, like in 10 chapters. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, this, this chapter is like, I found this chapter to be like very shallow in that like, it doesn't get into too much depth about all these problems that they encounter. It just like tries to like walk through the entire process of making a package. And then it just gives you like references to these like feature chapters that you can look at. Um, yeah, it's, it, 
uh, I, I could definitely see myself uh, having done like some error of it, like and totally will have done like the next one, like the side effects. Uh, I'm not a computer scientist, so the side effect, this is totally like something that I will have messed up. It just, side I think it, yeah, it's just the idea like, you know, you are using like the, the system, it's, it's depending of your operating system and stuff like that. So you are kind of like uh, the system. We will see the them later. Yeah, we'll see that in the next section yeah, for sure. I will definitely have. I have. I could have seen myself done these errors, and I could also like uh, maybe fail the namespace. I will not miss the dependency, but yeah, the namespace. I could have seen myself doing this error. I don't know if that will uh, make me avoid them now, but. <laughs> <laughs> I guess th th this is kind of the goal of this chapter, like make you like give you like some free error. I don't know. Yeah, it purposely makes these mistakes so that yeah you don't make them in the in the future. <laughs> Let's say right, reduce so. the the possibilities that you make them, but <laughs> can still make yeah them. reduce the probability <laughs> for sure. Okay. So the next section is that the, uh, the next problem is that the timestamps do not seem to work properly. And so uh, when we use sys.time, it gives us the current time in the system. And when we use our alt file path function, which is a function that makes uh, the name of our file path using our um, system.time, it gives us a different value. And so the timestamp reflects the time that the function was initially run rather than the current time in the system. So to understand this, I recall how we formed the file path for the output files. So we, we um, we call we call sys.time outside these two functions here, and we store this time inside the now object. Um, and so this this line of code now, sys.time function lies outside the alpha file path definition, and so it's only executed executed when the package is built, but never again. So the moral of the story is. Code outside your function is only built once at build time. And to avoid this problem, we want to move this line of code inside your uh, alt file path function. So that it's no longer um, what they call top level code. So if you move it inside your function, you get this, this function here, alt file path. Um, so this function, this, this default path will always timestamp as now, whereas this version of the alpha path will allow the user to provide a time um, by using this time parameter. But if you don't, if the user doesn't provide this time parameter, then um, the function will just default to now, which is the, uh, the current system, the time in your system. So the the uh, the lesson from this this uh, this section is you need to have a different mindset when defining objects that package. The objects should be functions, and these functions are generally these these functions should generally use data that they create or that is passed via an argument. So we, we want to avoid having these um, objects outside the function. So this is just like another difference between running our code in a script versus running our code inside an object or a package. All right, so for the, the last section of this chapter, um, the timestamps depend on which part of the world you're in. And so 
the month names vary, the time varies, and even the date varies. And we want to create a timestamp that are all in a fixed time zone. And to do this, we can use this sys.setLocal function and force a particular time zone by adjusting the tz environment variable. So we use sys.setLocal, and then we, we put these two things in there, lc time and c. And then we, we set the tz environment variable by using this function, sys.setEnvironment, and then tz equals utc. Um, but the bug also mentions that a user from Brazil would see, um, yeah, they would see something else. This. Oh yeah, okay. So what this is saying is, um, yeah. So when when they run this alpha file pass function. Which uses the timestamp function. Um, they, they will see, they will see this timestamp, but when they run the format function outside of or in a separate, um, separate call, they will still see this timestamp. So I think this is saying that our calls to sys.setLocal and sys.setEnvironment inside the timestamp function. So these two calls here, they have made what they call persistent change to their R session. So this side effect is undesirable and very difficult to track down and debug. So Olivia, I think you were talking about side effects a bit earlier. And I think this is what um, one example of side effect. Oh, you're muted, Olivia. Still muted. Oh, there you go. Yeah, um, a bit rude, I would say. There's a side effects that are kind of nice, like. Okay. <laughs> for example, a blood. You want this side effect? You want like the your. To, to, to have like this on your computer. This is the one. Yeah. Function is unstable for its work. Um, like this is this is a bit rude because it changed something uh, without letting you know you're changing something. Right. So if, and it's not like, uh, I mean, it's right in the function, but then let's say you you forget it, or it's seven in the function that you are calling. So it's not like you are. I mean, you can check what the function uh, function is doing. But if you are just calling the function, it's it's you do, you do not see it. And it changed like a, an environmental variable that uh, shouldn't be changed. So yeah, this is something yeah. that uh, I think it's very bad. Like I imagine, for example, like other stuff like people do all the time is like changing, like for example, the working directory. And obviously that, the working directory depends where you, the, uh, uh, yeah, depend where you have put it. And, so, and, and this is another example okay. of stuff like, uh, if you do that inside of a function, I mean, for your personal use, it's fine, I would say, um, but it's, uh, it could like, let's say like, for example, uh, I wrote some functions that usually like write a bunch of uh, file and directory. So I use some make, uh, some uh, file gear and stuff like that. And if I use like file gear uh, with like some specific uh, pass, it would create it inside of the user's file system. And it can be like, let's say, I don't know, it can put a mess into their <laughs> repository. This is another example of stuff that should be avoided, I guess. Yeah. So to avoid this side effect, we can use this with our package and uh, the local set of family of functions to keep the changes local to timestamp. Um, so yeah, with our local 
locale, then this, then use the local time zone function to set the time zone. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is just and giving I, you. Yeah, I like the second option more, but I'm probably like, because I think it provides more information. On the on the first one, you are converting your time zone to the UTC. On the second, you just let you know the the, the time into your time zone. Uh, no, you are converting it also. Okay, so now I, I will just like add the time zone to the to the file, but file name. I don't know how other I will do, but I will do that. Uh. So basically, they're all doing the same thing, but a little bit different syntax. Yeah, uh, this is my guess. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they're just they're just setting this, and then also setting the time zone to be UTC. But yeah, I'm not really sure what this is. I think this is local time. I'll see maybe. Okay. Could be wrong. Yeah, it's it's a local. Okay. So the local in our timestamp is temporarily modified with the with local function. Yeah. So. In our example, in, in this example here, we accidentally modified the user's overall state. If you actually do this, uh, you want to make sure that this is documented explicitly or you want to reverse this. And so the moral of this um, section is that, again, you need, to adopt, you need to adopt a different mindset and making functions that are packaged and don't you don't want to um, make any changes to the user's overall state, and and you want to make sure to reverse these changes if you make them, or document that document them explicitly, um, so that you don't uh, upset the user. Or your, your potential self letters. Well, thanks. And that's the end. I don't know if anyone like have question or want to add something. I mean, I, I, I kind of share like your point of view that this chapter could have been a bit, I don't know. It seems like a bit short and, but, uh, well, not every chapter need to be like uh, have like the same death also. I don't know, but yeah, oh. this was definitely like a quick one, but we still spend an hour on it. So, so yeah, so I guess yeah, I I think this chapter leaves a lot to be desired, um, but I guess that's kind of like the whole point of this chapter. Uh, yeah. just like go through a toy package and then um yeah you um you make a few mistakes along the way and then you learn from your mistakes by reading all these other chapters in the book this so, is a teaser package teaser yeah chapters. yeah but I, a, I, yeah getting I started see. it makes also a good point it's like it's also I feel a lot of the tidyverse package is also targeted at analysis analysts. So that's yes. uh, a bit like me that's run like a huge script, uh, like the first one, like even if it's not huge, like because what is done is pretty simple, but like, you, you know, like they use a huge script without like breaking it. And uh, they kind of show like you can break it even for a package perspective and make a more readable code. I think like, they also target this chapter like to a specific audience by 
you know, the, the elect uh, analysis workflow to display like even for analysis workflow, it can be good to build a package and all you can do that. So I think this is like also like target a specific audience, but could be wrong. I don't know what's also seen, but. Yeah. Maybe uh, we can ask Jenny what was her <laughs> intent. <laughs> Two questions, that's good enough. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, thanks for uh, sticking around and listening to my presentation. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess uh, next week, we oh yeah, we, we have a presenter next week, but the week yeah. after that, we don't have a presenter. Uh, we 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 have we have someone or we don't have someone. Let me go. Uh, I think. I think um, the person who was supposed to present cannot join us, so she removed herself from from the list. Oh. Uh, Sophie. Okay. Minakshi. Oh no, Sophie. Sophie's uh, Sophie's presenting next week. Okay, so um, we good. We're, we're but good. the week after that, we do not need to move. Anyway, yeah, I, I'm I'm running the chapter, so all the time I can present in case of. Oh, okay, sure, chapter eight. So okay, I'm pre well. Thanks everyone, and uh, see you next week. Hopefully, like you have a good week. Bye. 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 Have Bye. a good week, everybody. <laughs>